Well, welcome everyone this week to Gardens and Grub here at uh, the beautiful food lab in downtown Durham at the Cooperative Extension Office. My name is Sherilyn Berry, joining you for another week of um, all things food. So we are gonna talk about a very interesting topic today. I know I always say that, but to me, all of these foods are very interesting. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, just go ahead and raise your hand um, or write in the chat box in Zoom. We weren't able to go live on Facebook this week, but um, I'm sure we'll post this video. Uh, okay, so without further ado, let's talk a little bit about the food that we are going to be learning about today. So if you think in your mind, what's the most common grain that people consume in America? And usually the first thing that pops to people's minds is either wheat or rice, because they look at like what their dinner plate is usually holding. Um, but actually it's corn. Corn, America runs on corn, okay? It is in everything. Um, it is on a dinner plate just as corn, but it also is as diverse of products as, um, you know, corn chips, uh, popcorn, things that we consume directly as corn products, but then it's broken down into other things like that we consume like um, grits, high fructose corn syrup, different kinds of corn starches, thickeners. Um, it's broken down even further and it can be used in biodegradable plastics. When you pull up to your, uh, to the um, gas pump to fill up and it says up to 10% ethanol, that's all corn. If you eat meat or you drink milk or eat cheese, the basis of that is corn because corn is fed to all of most of the animals in America that we, we use as food products. So corn is everywhere. Um, there's a documentary called King Corn. I haven't watched it in years, but it's completely fascinating. Um, I highly recommend it. So check it out. Um, but first let's talk about, we're going to talk about a few different kinds of corn. Technically there's six different kinds of corn, but we're going to simplify it today to talk about sweet corn, popcorn, and field corn. So this is how people think of corn. See, I blacked out the little brand name. So if there's any brand names in this, no, as an extension professional, I'm not promoting any particular brand. Um, all the brands can be interchangeable with these products. So this is what we think of as corn, sweet corn. Um, sweet corn is delicious. Uh, the USDA classifies this as a vegetable. Um, however, botanically speaking, Corn is the seed to the one of the largest grasses in the world. So if you're eating corn in any form, it is a grain, it is not a vegetable. So just to let you know that if you're looking at your plate and you've got bread and corn and meat and you're thinking that's a complete deal, it's really not. You need to mix it up. This is part of a beige plate. So if we look at your plate, there's not a lot of color and it's beige, you wanna add some, you wanna eat a rainbow. Now yellow is good and white is good for white corn and yellow corn, but really go ahead and add on some, you know, other kinds of vegetables for greens and purples and blues and things like that. So let's look at, the anatomy of a corn kernel, okay? So this is gonna be really important later. So this area, the, the shell is called the pericarp and it's really tough and um, protects the seed inside. And then down here is the germ, the corn germ. And this is like a little pocket of oil of of uh, vitamin E that basically, and, and then the, the um, DNA is actually in the germ. And so the vitamin E oil protects it, it's an antioxidant, so it protects the DNA so that in this seed for this grass, uh, this DNA will be protected until it's planted. And then the endosperm is the starchy part. And that part for the plant is enough that if this is in the ground and, it, and water soaks through the pericarp and it's just the right temperature and just the right day length, the DNA will, will uh, start to make proteins and it will, this endosperm is just enough for this little plant to consume that starch just to get it up out of the ground so it can start making leaves and those leaves um, are solar panels that will allow the plant to make its own starch. So, um, but this is really important 
the pericarp is what we're going to talk about and the germ we're going to talk about that quite a bit so this is the part that really has the calories that we're looking for um, that we make all the different products out of um, but these all of these come into play for different products and we'll talk about that okay so first let's talk about like how corn is formed so here's corn see corn plants are actually very long grasses and these are the seed pods that uh, basically that's how you know corn is made. Um, now you can see this little purple silk sticking out of the top. Let's go ahead and focus in a little bit on that. So here is an ear of corn and here's all the silks. So I'm sure if you've ever eaten fresh corn and you peel back this this husk, there's going to be all of these silks and they kind of stick to everything and they're a little bit annoying. Um, but those are necessary because each one of those little silks is connected to a kernel. So this is sort of the female part of the plant. And then the male part, the tassels that hold the pollen, you'll see them, they, they kind of come out of the top in a little pom-pom. Um, that, that contains the male part and, and in order to get good corn where you get that nice perfect grid of corn that goes all the way down the, the corn, uh, the, the, uh, the ear of the corn, there needs to be a piece of pollen that falls on each one of these silks. If one of these silks misses pollen, there'll be a little hole where the corn kernel is supposed to be. Sometimes you'll see this, um, especially if you grow corn at home. So if you wanted to grow corn at home, that's great. Um, if you're not going to spray it and you're not going to grow GMO corn, you might get a little bollworm at the top. Don't worry, it's not going to hurt anything. Um, it's the same thing as a tomato fruit worm. You just cut that part off and the corn is good to go. If you're going to grow corn at home, grow it in a block if you can. Because uh, corn is wind pollinated, um, that tassel needs to shake and drop the pollen down onto the corn uh, the, the corn silks. Um, if you can only grow a row of corn, that's fine. Just make sure that you go out when you see the tassels open and the silks appear, you're going to go and break the tassels off and you're going to touch it all over the silks of the corn so that you get a fully developed ear of corn. Um, growing corn at home is really fun. Um, it's, it grows really fast and um, it's a little bit cold tolerant so you can plant it in the spring uh, and then let it grow um, for about a hundred days and you get like this beautiful corn and there's all different kinds. So, um, but that's, we primarily grow sweet corn at home. So let's talk a little bit about popcorn um, because that is a really fun, it's, it's, a, it's corn, it's still the same, it's still ZMAs, um, but it's grown uh, the same way, but picked differently. So this is popcorn. Everybody knows popcorn. Uh, it also comes in lots of cool, fun. This is part of, I have a huge collection of grains at my house. I eat a lot of different kinds of stuff. So this is a purple popcorn and it's bright white when it pops. And, uh, and then this, the, the sort of underside, the pericarp is, uh, is purple. So it, it, it gives you like a nice tender, but much smaller, um, uh, kernel. Whereas like this is your traditional popcorn and it's been bred to give you a really thin pericarp. So when the endosperm explodes, the pericarp is the kind of curled under crunchy part underneath and the endosperm is the, kind, the thing that's turned inside out. So when you grow popcorn, let me demonstrate it on our little diagram. So how it's different in popcorn is that in the endosperm, the endosperm is pretty hard. It's hard starch. And what I've drawn in here are these little droplets. And this is water that's trapped inside the popcorn. So in most other corns, you'll see where the corn has been cut off the cob and there's an opening in the bottom of it. Popcorn is completely encased. And so you're gonna get it hot. And when it gets to a certain temperature, these little, little uh, pockets of water are gonna turn into steam and they're gonna, um, increase the pressure on the inside of the piece of corn and it's going to explode. And so the endosperm explodes outwards into this nice crunchy puff. And then if you turn it over and you look underneath the little stuff that like sometimes gets stuck in your teeth and your throat, that is the pericarp and the germ. So um, popcorn is really great. It's easy to pop at home. Um, you don't have to get the microwavable kind that's got a bunch of weird stuff and um, sometimes unhealthy fats attached to it. Um, it takes very little to popcorn at home. You just heat a little um, 
a, a pot with a little bit of oil and you put one layer of popcorn on the bottom and make sure you vent the top because as you're popping the popcorn, it's steaming. That steam is being released. And if you trap it in the pan, your uh, corn will be chewy rather than crunchy. Also, once you bring home your popcorn, if you buy it in a bag and you open the bag, put it in an airtight container. Some brands come in a container, which is great um, because uh, the popcorn, when they pick it, it's kind of moist and they dehydrate it so that it's between 14 and 20% moisture still trapped on the inside. If you let your popcorn totally dry out, it won't pop. So if you've got some old popcorn and you throw it in a pot, people think, oh, I don't know how to pop popcorn. It's not popping for me. What it is, is the water is evaporated from it. So there's no steam in there to build up the pressure on the inside of the endosperm and explode the thing. So um, buy yourself some fresh popcorn and keep it in an airtight container. You should be good to go. So now those were both pretty simple. Let's talk about field corn. So this is like common field corn. Um, there's different kinds. There's dent corn and flint corn, and we're not going to go into all of that. Um, field corn is the most diverse form of corn that we use in the United States. The, you know, the gas in your car, um, high fructose corn syrup, corn starch, uh, plastics. I mean, you name it. There's, you know, what, this is what they feed animals. They, they crush fresh uh, field corn like this and they take the stalks it was growing on and they put them in big piles near feedlots and cover them and they let it kind of cook. They let the micro, uh, the microorganisms start to break down the, um, what they call silage um, so that it's more digestible to animals. So um, this is made into little pellets to feed rabbits. This is made into dog food, cat food. There's some form of corn um, in most of the packaged foods that you eat. And, um, and, and in pretty much all of the commercially produced um, animal foods out there. So uh, just something to keep in mind, like we really do use a lot of corn. So corn was actually um, it, a product of the Americas. So um, in current day Mexico, um, the Aztec peoples, the Olmecs, the Incas, you can find this kind of field corn in, um, in you know, burial sites all over the place. And they've been using corn for thousands and thousands of years. But the way that they used corn was a little bit different. So when we talk about corn that you, know, that you eat on the table, they did a totally different thing. So if you've ever had a corn tortilla or tortilla chips, then you've eaten a product of nixtamalization. So nixtamal is the process of exposing field corn to calcium hydroxide or slaked lime. So what scientists and um, anthropologists have surmised is the way that uh, the ancient peoples figured out how to do this is that they did not have pots they could put directly on the fire. So they would heat up big chunks of limestone till they were burning hot. And then they'd put them in their clay pots to soften corn so they can make things out of it. And lime, not lime that you squeeze into a drink, but slaked lime or limestone is an alkaline substance, which means it's like um, there's acidic, neutral, and basic or alkaline. That's this type of product. Um, and what it does actually is when you expose, ooh, there, there. when you expose corn to lime or calcium hydroxide or also wood ash, wood ash is also alkaline, you end up dissolving this pericarp off the outside. So it dissolves the pericarp so it makes the inside and, and the inside ends up, um, uh, the endosperm absorbs a lot of water. The, the alkaline substance dissolves this pericarp off the outside and then it releases this germ out into solution. So you can, it's really easy to knead and make a dough out of. If you just crush corn and you don't nixtamalize it, you get things like grits, cornmeal. You can make you can make like a um, quick bread, like a cornbread out of this, or you can make a porridge out of it, but you can't make a dough out of it. This is non nixtamalized this is just ground field corn. Um, but if you wanna make corn tortillas or tortilla chips, 
um, then you nixtamalize the corn. And not only does it make it so that you can make a dough out of it because it emulsifies some of the fats in there, but it also releases a molecule of niacin, which is um, a B3. And um, if, if we don't get enough B3, we can get deficiency diseases. This happened a lot once we started refining grains and we stopped eating, um, we stopped eating like whole grains as Americans. Um, that's why when you read on a package of food, it has any kind of like uh, grain in it, it usually says enriched cornmeal or enriched uh, rice or enriched flour because if you process it, you're gonna be removing some of the nutrients out of it and America's figured out, the world has figured out how to enrich our grains and other foods to make sure that while we extend shelf life, while we uh, process foods, we also need to make sure that we're not causing deficiency diseases in the general population. So the ancient peoples of Mesoamerica figured out that if they nixtamalize the corn, you can make tortillas out of it, um, you can make porridges out of it, you can make all kinds of different things out of it, um, and it's more malleable and it's more nutritious. So they had less um, deficiency diseases. Now, corn is not a complete protein. It doesn't have all the eight amino acids that you need. We have eight essential amino acids that we need. Our body can't like make them spontaneously on their own. Um, and so you'll sometimes see that on like a cereal box or another food, all eight essential amino acids. And all animal foods have all eight essential amino acids, but plants don't always have them all. So that's why corn by itself is lacking a couple of those essential amino acids, but beans have the essential amino acids that corn is lacking, but it lacks a couple that corn has. So that's why a lot of times you see beans and corn grown together. Um, in fact, in, um, in ancient, in current day Mexico, but uh, ancient Mesoamerican peoples, and this even continues on today, um, is they grow the three sisters. So you grow corn, which is a sort of very hungry plant that needs a lot of nitrogen. So you've got corn growing next to beans and beans, uh, the pole beans will actually crawl up the corn so the corn is uh, is like a scaffolding for it, a trellis for it. And so the corn grows up and so does the beans and the beans provide nitrogen to the soil um, through a symbiotic relationship with a little bacteria that lives with it. And then you grow squash along the ground and squash um, covers the ground so that you don't have as much evaporation from um, from water loss, from you know evaporation in uh, the hot sun, because these are all summer plants, um, and also chokes out the weeds because it shades the ground. So that's a very common um, ancient people's way of growing things, and it's still done um, all over through Mexico, South America, and the desert southwest um, of the U.S. So, um, so yeah. So let's talk about a few more of these products. Um, hominy. Um, if you see hominy, this is sort of like right after they nixtamalize it, this is what it looks like. It's this really soft, if you've ever had like pozole or menudo, um, this is a delicious thing you can add to soups and stews. It's very filling and it's very nutritious. Um, so hominy, that's great. Um, and then, oh, so be careful when you go in. If you want to eat more nutritious things, get tortilla chips. So there are corn chips. If you see corn chips, that's not nixtamalized corn. Tortilla chips are nixtamalized corn. So um, also, so let me talk a little bit real quick about our non-nixtamalized stuff. So um, in here in the South, um, some people feel like these five minute grits are um, an abomination because uh, Grits take 25 minutes and, um, and they're, you know, it's just some of the ladies out here are like, quick grits, are you kidding? You know, that it would be wrong to do quick grits. Um, but uh, something to show you, because I've got a couple different kinds of grits here. So grits, also called polenta, in um, the south of Italy, people eat a lot of corn and they call it polenta there. Um, you can also get it prepared like this in a log where you can just slice it and fry it, but it's, you can make it into a porridge. This one has been degerminated. That means that they removed this part here. Um, and what that does, when you remove the germ from a grain, although it takes away a lot of the good nutrition in it, what it does is it extends the shelf life because the germ is encased in vitamin E oils, you know, and other kinds of oils, um, but an antioxidant oil. And as soon as you grind it, 
it makes it, it oxidizes it with, you know, with light and air. You've exposed it, you've broken apart that little protective area and you've exposed it to light and air. So it oxidizes. So this would spoil faster if you left the germ in it. So if you want what's the most nutritious thing for you and you want the, you want the most nutritious grits, just turn it over and the ingredients should just say corn. This one is degerminated cornmeal with um, some uh, vitamins sprayed back on it. Still delicious, still good for you, still good to eat, lasts a lot longer, um, but it, you know, the flavor of something that's just corn is amazing. Again, the brands don't matter because this brand has regular grits too. Um, so ignore, ignore the brands, look more at the ingredients. That's the most important part um, for you to know what you're eating. So um, if you do buy something that's just corn and it's not degerminated and you're gonna keep it for more than a couple of months, um, just stick it in your fridge or your freezer, put it in a zip top bag, stick it in your freezer, it'll last for years. So um, just kind of push the air out of the bag and, uh, and that makes a big difference. I do that with pretty much all of my grains. Um, if they're stone ground or something like that, the whole grain, that's what they mean by whole grain is that um, all of the grain is used. The, uh, you know, the, the pericarp or the hull or the bran, depending on what grain you're talking about. Um, and then the, the part that's most important because everybody wants the endosperm because it's the starchy delicious part, um, but the germ has the most nutrition and can also cause things to go bad really quickly. So um, if you ever open up a, a thing of flour or, or other kind of grain and you smell it and it smells bitter, it's gone off and it won't necessarily hurt you. It just, you know, I'm not that hungry. Like it, it would, I'd feed it to the chickens or something like that or compost it because um, when stuff oxidizes, it actually is an oxidant then. So your body will have to come up with antioxidants to counteract it. Plus if it, if it smells bitter, it's gonna taste bitter too. So it won't kill you, but it doesn't taste good. So, and you know, life is short. You should have the very best. Okay, so real quick, let me finish this up because I know you might have questions. Um, the other thing that is very, popular for corn is corn syrup. Let's see, we'll hide my brand name. And, uh, and high fructose corn syrup. So another, way, another product is corn starch. So corn starch is another product of highly refined corn, but it starts out like that. It's this, this field corn that makes these products. So corn syrup, when, when they get the glucose out of the, um, out of, they, they basically take these starches and they use an enzyme and they chop up the starches into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And a lot of them end up being sucrose, which is uh, glucose and fructose bonded together. And then what they end up doing, so this is almost like common sugar. And this, they add another enzyme to it so that there's a higher proportion of fructose in it. Because fructose, even though it is chemically almost identical to uh, glucose, it, uh, it just, it's a little different. It's a little different con configuration. It tastes sweeter with less of it. So high fructose corn syrup is where they've changed it chemically so they can use less of it, which costs less to make it as sweet or sweeter than if you just added table sugar to it. So um, sugar is sugar is sugar, um, whether it's table sugar or it's high fructose corn syrup or uh, honey or anything like that, sugar is sugar is sugar. Um, but high fructose corn syrup has sort of been demonized because corn is very, very political and we don't have time to talk about it today, but the politics of corn and the Corn Refiners Association and I mean, how many, how many of our Congress members are funded by corn? Um, we could go into that for a whole other hour at least. Um, but to suffice it to say, you know, everything in moderation because this is liquid energy. Um, all of this stuff is energy. That's what glucose is. That's what starches are, is energy for your body and your brain. But this is like mainlining any, and it isn't this just this product, anything that has those really reduced sugars that are super, super, super sweet. So um, anyway, this is our tiny little journey through corn. We could talk about this so much more, but um, I have to cut it off for questions. Um, corn is gluten-free. Um, we could talk about gluten on another one. I think that'd be a really good topic because people think gluten is bad, but they don't even really know what it is. So maybe we should do gluten because I think um, I think that would be super interesting for people to truly understand um, what gluten is, what gluten-free is, what celiac is, things like that. But that's a topic for another time. So uh, thank you for listening to this and uh, please ask questions.
So we have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, has corn been a product of the U.S. diet for a long time or is it a fairly new um, concept? Fairly new concept because before, you know, not too long ago, like not even a hundred years ago, half of us in the United States were farmers and we grew a lot of our own food and we would pasture animals, you know, they would be out in pasture and yeah, we would use field corn for certain things, but primarily we were eating wheat, uh, vegetables and our animal products usually like pigs would eat whatever was left over um, if from the house, if you kept your own pig. And if you had cows you or sheep or goats, they would have pasture and you, you know, you move them paddock to paddock and they would eat grass. We didn't have this big gigantic like, um, like the concentrated animal feeding operations. And, you know, we didn't go to the store for everything that we eat. And now that we do, uh, some of it is kind of tied to um, the military and needing packaged foods for the military and also women moving into the workplace um, after, during and after World War II, um, that really there was an explosion of packaged foods because mom wasn't able to cook and clean for 10, 12 hours a day anymore, she was working. And so um, this whole kind of burgeoning industry of packaged and processed foods, um, plus having you know reduced amount of farmers over a hundred years had, had really sort of had an explosion of, you know how do we get the most for the amount of land that we have to feed the most people. And there's lots of factors that went into that, but that's really when corn started to really get bigger and bigger um, because you could uh, grow more calories on a smaller amount of land and then break that down into products that could be used across the spectrum of, of the food system. Um, so no, we, we were not surviving off of corn exclusively, um, or it wasn't this sort of shadow product in everything that we use. It really did grow steadily since World War II. And another question was, how is corn syrup made? What is corn syrup? Is it just boiled corn? Is it processed? So what is it? If you take this corn, which is very complex, and uh, you take the endosperm, and just like any other kind of syrups, and you expose it to enzymes that take, um, they're called amylases, and you'll get this if you take a cracker, I'm sure you did this in school, you take a white saltine cracker and chew it and chew it and chew it and chew it and it would get sweeter as you chew it, that's salivary amylase. That's amylase is something that breaks down starches into smaller and smaller pieces. And the shorter your starch chain, the sweeter it is. So this endosperm has starch chains that are thousands and hundreds of thousands of units long. And then when you expose them to, um, to amylases, there's salivary amylase, we have a pancreatic amylase, and then you can have amylases out, you know, you, you can just make them in a chemical lab and then use them and they chop up, chop up, chop up, chop up the cornstarch, so cornstarch, and they chop, 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 chop it up. And then you cook this down and purify it and you get this pure sugar product that's full of disaccharides. So you've taken those long chains and chopped them up till they're all two units long. And the shorter the sugar, the sweeter it is. So, you know, fructose and glucose, those are monosaccharides. They're one unit sugars. Um, but like a starch is glucose times 10 hundred thousand look at that technical term. Um, and so that's taste starchy. It doesn't taste sweet because the unit is really long. And when you eat it, the sweetness comes from shorter chains. So that's a, in a nutshell how it's made. I remember having corn syrup on pancakes when I was a little girl. That was <laughs> what we, they did the dark corn syrup yeah. on the pancakes. So I'm going to see if anybody in the audience has any questions or anybody in the, in the chat has any questions. That was a lot of stuff to learn. I didn't realize. Uh, I know it's a lot. Like this could be a whole class like for a couple of hours because there's all these politics surrounding corn and like just there's a lot with corn, like the power of corn, the political power and money of corn, like from everything from plastics to recyclables to food to animals to um to, to ethanol in cars, all of those have different lobbies for different reasons, and they're all paying politicians. It's a whole thing, but, I, but we're keeping it to food today. <laughs> all right. Well, I don't see that anybody has any questions. I'll give it just another second to see if anybody does. Thank you, Ms. Sherilyn. I always learn so much from these talks. Good. So uh, maybe we'll do gluten next week. I mean, we haven't talked about that yet. You want to do gluten, guys? Let's do that. Let's talk about it. 
All right. So join us next week when we will talk about all things gluten. All things gluten, baby. Where it comes from, where it's going, and why people hate it. <laughs> all right. Bye, guys. Bye.